so they can't find the document. We are learning more about this week's blockbuster reporting that special counsel Jack Smith has an audio recording of former President Trump in 2021 seemingly admitting, again on tape, that he took a classified document with him when he left the White House, a classified document allegedly detailing plans of how the U.S. could attack Iran. That document. Well, tonight we have new reporting that Trump's lawyers do not know where that document is. They are unable to find the war plans Trump may have been casually waving around at his New Jersey golf club two years ago. Everybody check your golf carts, ask your caddies. Anybody see any stray plans for war in Iran? No. We are going to talk about that a little bit later tonight. But first, we also got some big news in one of the other Trump investigations. And it came out of Fulton County, Georgia, where District Attorney Fonnie Willis is investigating Trump's effort to overturn the 2020 election results. Now, let me back up first. Do you remember this story from February about how Trump's campaign had hired a team of researchers to prove their bogus 2020 fraud claims, their, their claims that the election had been stolen? Well, it turns out that when Trump's own researchers found there was no there there, Trump's campaign buried that report. That was followed by this story from April about how Trump's campaign had actually hired a second team of researchers to also try to prove the campaign's bogus 2020 election fraud claims. And that second firm also found zero evidence of election fraud. So Trump's campaign buried that second report as well. Now, tonight, the Washington Post reports that in recent days, D.A. Fani Willis has sought information from both of those research firms. She has even gone as far as to subpoena at least one of them. And what makes Fani Willis looking into these firms and their reports, what makes that so interesting, what makes it substantively different from other dribs and drabs we have gotten out of this investigation so far, is this, quote, Willis's office has asked both firms for information, not only about Georgia, but about other states as well. I know that for a lot of people around the country, the moment Trump's get me 11,780 votes call became public, the case against him in Georgia seemed basically open and shut. There was Trump on tape using fake election claims to try to pressure Georgia's Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger, to swing the election Trump's way. But in a court of law, the burden of proof is high. You have to be able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Trump knew he was lying when he made those assertions that the election was stolen. And so in that regard, these reports and the firms that wrote them, they are key. Remember this claim that Trump made on that same call while trying to pressure Raffensperger to find him those 11,000 votes. The other thing, uh, dead people, so dead people voted, and I think uh, the the number is in the pro uh, close to 5,000 people, and they went to uh, obituaries, they went to uh, all sorts of methods to come up with an accurate number, and a minimum is close to about 5,000 voters. Beyond that claim being bonkers, it is also incredibly specific, and Trump should have known at the time that it was wrong. One of the groups the Trump campaign hired to look into their fraud claims, the Berkeley Research Group, they had already debunked this. They found that there were at maximum 23 ballots that may have been cast in the name of a dead person in Georgia. 23. And they told Trump himself before his call with Raffensperger. Quote, senior officials from the Berkeley Research Group briefed Trump, then Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, and others on the findings in a December 2020 conference call. Trump knew. He knew, or at least he was told in no uncertain terms, that there was no fraud. No thousands or even hundreds of dead voters. So you can see why the DA, Fonnie Willis, would want to talk to the people that gave the Trump campaign that report. You can see why she might want their testimony. This was Trump himself being told by his own researchers with multiple potential corroborating witnesses on the call that his fraud claims about Georgia were false. And the reason that is so important is because the defense being made by Trump's allies right now, including by his former January 6th lawyer, Tim Parlatori, to my colleague Ari Melber this very evening tonight, is that prosecutors must be able to prove that Trump knew his election fraud claims were false at the time that he was making them.
You don't think it's heading towards an indictment of Donald Trump, but you do think other people may ultimately be indicted in that? You know, I'm not sure, really. I, I don't believe that it's going to touch my former client. In order for it to be something that you would criminally charge, you have to show that the claims that they made at the time were knowingly false. You'd have to show that, you know, for example, uh, my former client knew that there was no fraud in the election when he claimed that. Well, Fonnie Willis is now zeroing in on that proof in the form of those two internally discarded reports that showed Trump knew his lies were false at the time he made them. Again, The Washington Post reporting tonight that Willis's office has asked both firms for information, not only about Georgia, but about other states as well. These reports looked into the Trump campaign's bogus voter fraud claims in state after state after state, and they found no evidence that any of them were true. Now, Fonnie Willis is investigating a lot of avenues here. She's looking at the calls Trump made to multiple Georgia state officials, like Brad Raffensperger. She is looking at the Trump campaign's effort to get the Georgia state legislature to declare Trump the winner of the 2020 election. She is looking at the fake electors scheme, and she is looking at the Trump campaign's potential involvement in the unauthorized breach of election equipment in Coffee County, Georgia. And all of those efforts by Trump and his campaign are a lot harder to excuse legally when you look at the actual evidence compiled by Trump's own consultants. Trump's campaign had been told in December of 2020 by their own researchers that there was no evidence of widespread voter fraud in any of the states they looked at. So their justification for pressuring the Georgia state legislature, Trump's justification for convening the, asking his campaign somehow to convene fake electors, their justification for everything in Coffee County, Trump's justification for what exactly he was trying to do on the call with Brad Raffensperger, all of that gets a lot harder for them to hide behind. Joining us now are former U.S. attorneys Barbara McQuaid and Harry Littman. Can we talk about the RICO uh, chart potential RICO case here, Barb? Because whenever Fonnie Willis's name is mentioned, RICO racketeering is, is like soon to follow. And a lot of folks think outside the DA's office that it may be a, a RICO charge that she's looking at for Trump. To Harry's point, how difficult would that be? And would she have to look at actions in other states or could she just look at what happened in Georgia? Yeah, I think the reason that we are hearing speculation about RICO is that Fannie Willis has a track record of using the RICO statute. And sometimes it's a very valuable tool for prosecutors. RICO can be thought of like an umbrella. It, it is allowed to sort of cover a whole variety of different crimes that are tied together. So for example, it would allow her to charge in the same case uh, both the call to Raffensperger, the false statements to the legislature, uh, breaching of the equipment in Coffee County, uh, the false le uh, uh, electors. All of that could come together as a pattern of racketeering activity. And so for that reason, it allows a jury to understand the full scope of the crime. But I share Harry's hesitation about going outside the state of Georgia and getting so much bigger and bigger and bigger. You know, a common phrase prosecutors use uh, in, in talking with their colleagues is, you don't need to boil the ocean, charge your case. And sometimes, uh, you know, I think prosecutors want to track down every possible lead uh, to make their case as strong as possible. But at some point you have to know that it, it's time to move on. And uh, I, I would like to see her, even if she uses RICO, would be fine, but stick to what's happening in Georgia uh, you know, that's sort of her remit. Let the Justice Department handle the national scope. Yeah. To, so to the, just to, to keep just to stay on this for one more second here, you can build a racketeering case in Georgia. Part of the reason that reporting has suggested that maybe this is a more national RICO case, which would be novel, is because these firms that we're talking about, uh, the ones that were enlisted by the Trump campaign to determine whether there was election fraud, they looked at state, they looked at activities in Georgia, Pennsylvania, Arizona, Nevada, Michigan, and Wisconsin. And so it sounds like the thinking there, and this is the really outside the box thinking, is maybe Fonnie Willis is looking at Arizona and Michigan and other states and saying Georgia is but a piece of broader na national fraud that was perpetrated by the Trump campaign. Is that, is that what everyone should understand about what we're talking about here? 
Yes, that is the hypothesis, and it's true that the Georgia RICO, which is expansive even for RICO laws, permit her to sweep in all of this stuff. Remember, the special grand jury, uh, if she follows that blueprint, she's already talking about 15 or more defendants, and RICO does, as Barb says, sweep everything in. It basically says that it's not just discrete crimes, but they are, you know, that basically Trump is the head of a whole racketeering enterprise. It was passed originally for the mafia. So it's there in theory, but I really want to second what Barb said. I think this goes for Jack Smith, too. It's now time, having gathered all the evidence they have, for them to pare down, not expand out You the, the keeping your eye on the ball, which is conviction, rather than uh, sprawling charges, I think, is what a seasoned prosecutor will do.